Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa. Bhutang damang sanggang namasami. So on several of the uh, previous talks I gave, I mentioned about some of the main teachings of Ajahn Chah. First one I mentioned was about uh, Dukkha is our teacher. Dukkha, suffering, unsatisfactoriness was our teacher. The second one was about uh, impermanence. All conditioned things are impermanent. And I don't know if anybody recognized, but uh, these are two of what's called the three characteristics of reality. And uh, the, the third one is anatta, no permanent self. But these are themes which, you know, they're, they're ultimate truths about reality. But the fact is that most people just don't see them. That's why you know, usually it requires a teacher or any compassionate teacher would be, but it would emphasize these teachings just to remind us. So uh, Ajahn Chah gave these teachings to have compassion for us so we can get, a, get some clear understanding of reality, even though it's right in front of us all the time, but you know, by our, you know, our hindrances, by our uh, ignorance, we just don't see it. So the uh, the third one, anatta, no no permanent self, is uh, it even seems to be in the Buddhist time. It was a little bit hard for people to comprehend. It seems that many people, especially the religious people, they already knew a certain amount about dukkha. Many times it was the real the reason why you know people were out spiritually seeking, and this was sort of exemplified in the the Buddha's own story. As the tradition says that you know the Buddha lived a very sheltered life in his early well, the Buddha to be actually, Siddhartha Gotama was had a very sheltered life. But when he was exposed to old age, sickness, and death, you know the the ultimate unsatisfactoriness of life, he really had a, you know, transformation. I mean, it initially, it just, I guess it depressed him. You know, it's, he realized that, oh, he'd been living a bit of a fantasy, and the life wasn't, the, the life he thought it was not really the, the real nature of life. But then there was hope. We saw it in the religious mendicant. There was a possibility of a way out of this conundrum of dukkha. So a lot of the religious seekers in the Buddhist time were, were already familiar with that. That's why they were out seeking, seeking for some solution. And of course, they had some idea also of impermanence. You know, old age, sickness, and death are a very, um, you know, very personal example of impermanence. Your young body becomes old and your healthy body becomes sick and eventually it passes away. You know. And it just so happened that, it, you know, at that time in India, well, I guess many places in the world, but in India at that time, uh, you know, there was uh, a lot of the, uh, like, like death was not covered up. Death was very, you know, people, people saw it every day. I mean, I guess in, 
in the countryside now, people live in the country, they also, maybe not human death, but they see the death of animals. And, but in India in those days, uh, they would be, they just cremate the corpses or they just, I guess the poor people, they just left the bodies in the charnel grounds. So it was, you know, it was very, very uh, obvious to people. You know, death was a very common, ordinary experience. But the Buddha realized, and the people, the religious seekers realized, oh, there was a way out, religious seeking. But the teaching on anatta, that was much harder for people to comprehend because it sort of went, to, went, went against the grain of the indigenous, indigenous religion of India, Brahmanism, because uh, they, they had a very strong belief in a permanent Atman. It was, the, it was the Atman, the soul, if you like, which joined with Brahma to become awakening, become enlightenment. So it seems that, you know, the Buddha, he just reminded people about impermanence and he gave meditations on reflecting upon impermanence and dukkha. Yeah. But uh, for Anatta, he seemed to have, at least the record in the scriptures shows that he had to explain it from various angles. People couldn't really comprehend it. Went against the, the culture of the time. Same, same today. I mean, if people here in the West you know, then they hear the translation of anatta as no self. Some people are just incredulous. Like, what? No self, but here I am. I got my own Facebook account. Yeah, I must be somebody. <laughs> but what the Buddha was pointing at, of course, was not, it was, it was this ultimate self, this, uh, this uh, belief in a permanent abiding self, which transcended death. Not the everyday self, uh, which we, we write about, we refer to. People say, who are you? You refer to your just conventional relative self. You don't say, well, unless you're real, I guess a real you know, soul seeker or something. You really <laughs> look into your soul and say, well, I don't know who I am really. You know, I, I haven't really done enough soul searching yet. Find out who I really am. But a Buddha tells us, fortunately, this is a, don't waste your time. <laughs> You're not going to find it anyway. <laughs> but see, people still have that, you know, even, even though they, they may be uh, contemplate it, and they still don't really understand it. It's a very, very deep insight. It requires a very, very deep insight. Yet on the other hand, I would say that Virtually all the religions are pointing to that too. You know, the, the so-called theistic religions, you know, you, they, they teach about how you lo lose yourself in God. You know, you're, you're this the so-called self unites with God. So you, you lose yourself. You become like God, you know, merge with God or something. So they are teaching selflessness as well, but a different point of view. I mean, I could say it's a very, it's a much more positive one. You know, myself yanting with God is more positive than myself just disappearing, <laughs> being empty. <laughs> but it's a readily available insight for anybody uh, once they investigate. I mean, it's mostly due to people holding on to a fixed view that they've, they've picked up. You know, there is a soul, and or they just don't look carefully enough. They don't really investigate it. You know, who are you? Say, well, I'm, I'm and then they rattle off your, you know, your, 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 your you rattle off your nationality or your, your, uh, your uh, education or something, brother, or your profession or something. But if somebody was to really stop you and say, who are you really? Maybe you might stop in their tracks and say, well, I actually never thought about it. <laughs> Most people, they didn't really think about it very deeply. And you point out that you know their their so-called career, their nationality, their their uh, education is changing all the time. You know, you're you're learning new things all the time. 
maybe you don't get you know another degree or something, but you're always learning something every day. So uh, yeah, this this learning process is changing all the time. So so that that self is changing then, huh? And you can keep you have to keep adding to your CV every day. Learn something every day. If you really look at it, maybe some of the lessons you learn are not so you know not so friendly or not so uh, not so attractive. Uh, learning your limitations, uh, you know, learning about you know, through your bursts of anger or something or other or whatever whatever gets to you. Uh, but you can learn from it. But the Buddha had many approaches then to the teaching of trying to trying to trying to give people an insight into no permanent self. The very very first one he gave, which was the second teaching he gave to the five of his first disciples, the Anattalakana Sutta, characteristic of no permanent self. What he pointed out was our lack of control. And this is something, you know, everybody, every meditator actually learns this lesson, whether they know it or not. You know, this, it kind of creeps up on you, even though you don't, you don't have a name for it. But when you just try and sit meditation and watch your breath, you know, if, if this body-mind was really belong to you, then why can't you do that exercise? This really is your mind. You can just say, okay, just watch the breath. So does it happen? Well, a little bit. Huh? <laughs> Take up a few breaths, and then your mind goes off somewhere. Huh? Uh, well, if this mind is really yours, why can't you control it? Why do you never have no control over your mind? You know. So you you learn this. Ah, right. Whose mind is this then? You know, I thought it was mine, but then when I notice what the mind's doing, you know, I didn't consciously think about those thoughts or those memories. They popped into my head. So who's who's controlling my mind then? Better not better not think too much about that. <laughs> then you get ideas. Maybe I got to find some conclusion. Oh, it's coming from above. Uh, yeah. God is speak, speaking to me, or the devil speaking to me, or somebody's. Maybe the animals in the forest are speaking to you or something. <laughs> but just uh, if you just look at that experience, you realize, oh, yeah, this mind, if, you know, if I'm not able to control my mind, it's not really mine, is it? It's not really my true self. I don't really have control over it. So you get some little bit of insight into not no permanent self then. It's a lack of control. There is a certain degree of of control you can say, because we can with some effort we can you know, give direction to the mind. We can't control it, but you can give some direction to it. You try to watch the breath and the mind wanders off. Well, you can just go with the wandering and wandering and wandering all the rest of your life, or you can say, oh, back to the breath again back to the breath again. But that's limited to control. That's not ultimate control over your, over your mind. And the, the, the second one, the second, probably the most, second most common, but actually the most common example the Buddha gave, of course, follows on from impermanence. If you're investigating impermanence, then you all you notice how you know this what we take to be ourself is constantly changing. You know, today you take yourself to be like this. You know, just for example, like a certain mood. Wake up in the morning and say, "Oh, I feel happy." Yeah, and then you come down. You know, they, I don't know. You people they, they they get up and then they turn on their 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 phone and look at the messages and oh, now I am I am unhappy. <laughs> There's some message that I, I have to pay a bill or something, rather. So your, your first self in the morning was happy, and then suddenly it changes, uh, depending upon certain conditions. And then all through the day, if you look at that, you know, how am I? 
who am I? Now I'm happy, now I'm not so happy, just the, just the feelings, for example. Yeah, that are my, I, I see my, my, myself, if you see yourself more as a physical entity, okay? oh, now I'm, I feel, you know, first thing in the morning, I feel you know, rested and, uh, and reasonably relaxed, and then after a little while walking around, I feel tired. And not to mention all the, you know, the memories that may come up. And when we're contemplating impermanence, we also get a, you know, the, the, the follow-up lesson is on no permanent self. Constantly changing, constantly changing. Do you see anything with all this changing uh, phenomena of physical and mental? Do you see something which is steady all the way through it? Maybe you do notice there is something like some degree of awareness or knowing. It seems to be fairly steady. But again, you look at, look at the, this, this awareness, this knowing, this consciousness, vinyan. You look at that, and it's also, you know, there's this consciousness of something. So then you're, you're conscious, you have a consciousness of tasting, of smelling, of touching. Consciousness of thinking, okay. even consciousness is changing. There is a, a continuity of consciousness, but it's always different. So your, your consciousness can't be yourself either. Hmm. The more we bring awareness into the process, investigation, you know, it's more like recognizing what, what that self is not. It's not this can't be the changing body, that's not, that's not a, you know, a permanent self, can't be the mind isn't, it's not permanent. Gradually we begin to, to eliminate uh, the possibilities. The one which the, the Buddha, well, by tradition, the, the refle reflection on impermanent, of a no permanent self, which the Buddha was awakened to, the method he was waking to it in the, in the scriptures was through the contemplating the, the, the causality of things, of things arise from a cause. And this was a little bit safer, you can say, in a way, because, you know, there is, there is the causal sequences there, yeah. but the, these causal sequences, yeah, because they are always changing, they always are different, there's no, there's no solidity to them rather than the process itself. So the Buddha reflected upon, you know, the, you know what's, what's the cause of suffering? As I was say, that was his kind of starting point. What's the cause of suffering? Being born. What's the cause of being born? It's becoming. What's the cause of becoming? It's craving. It's back and back, all the way back to ignorance. It's not knowing. And even, you know, not knowing also sets up, you know, there's sort of psychological processes there. You know, not knowing, then we, when we act, we act through ignorance. And this, this uh, the, the kind of foundation of that ignorance is that we believe in a self. We believe this body is mine. At a very, very young age, young, you know, just like it's been conditioned into us, you know. I don't, don't think that, that the so-called, you know, the, the child, when it's in the womb, they say it doesn't have a self. It doesn't think of itself. It can't distinguish itself from the mother. It's only after a few years, apparently, what, what the psychologists say anyway, I think. That's, that's the latest psychology, I don't know yet, but old, old psychology anyway. The self only develops after a few years. When the self, when the, when the young child recognizing, oh, I am a unique individual. If I scream, then food is brought to me. And the subject, subject begins to develop independent of an object. But there, you know, there is a, a process there, ongoing processes. It doesn't leave the, you know, the self kind of empty at all completely empty and void, 
there is still the process that's still going on there. So rather than say, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I know I'm not, I'm not the body or the mind, okay? But you're left with then you're left with ignorance. <laughs> Don't know if that's any consolation. <laughs> Or it's more like even 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 uh, you can't even you you can't even own ignorance. Ignorance just is, just just like the you know the, the air in this room. You 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 breathe the air goes into your into your lungs and say I'm breathing. Yeah. The air passes out again. You know the, the air is there. Uh, you're just participating in it. So ignorance is there, and it manifests in this particular body-mind complex. We don't see clearly, don't understand clearly. And it's based upon a certain belief in a permanent abiding self. I mean, it's just kind of a part of a developmental process because you know, the, the person needs a point of reference. So it, it has its benefits, but but most of us overdo it. And then we not only we believe in ourselves, then we have to defend ourselves. Yeah? Defend our what we what we say is our is our self. Defend our body. Yeah, it does keep it going for a certain lifetime anyway. But you know, there's, there's also a limit to it. Yeah, when your body gets sick, yeah, you can fight all you want, but maybe you have to succumb to it. But reflecting on the the causal the causal conditions, then you know it's 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 very impersonal, just conditions, just conditions. So most of the the teachers, uh, they they when they talk about, you know, when they're trying to give people some awareness of no permanent self, they point out the various factors. You know, there there is the five the five khandas, five groups of grasping there. They're just functions, just impersonal functions. There is a physicality, there is a feeling, there is a, there is a memories, there is a mental activities, and there is knowing, consciousness. But those are there anyway. You know, and then we project onto that a certain self. You know, I feel this. There's a feeling there when you observe it. There's a feeling which many, sometimes you can't even know where they come from. There's a feeling there, and then, then you say, oh, I am feeling, as, a, as an extra. And when you have that feeling, and then there's a reaction to it. When you feel happy, you want to defend it and keep on, keep, keep it. And it slips away, and then you feel disappointed. You recognize it's just an impersonal function. Well, pleasant feeling, unpleasant feeling, then... Yeah, the, the, it says in the scriptures, when you investigate the nature of feelings, then you don't, you don't compound them. You don't chase after pleasant feeling. You don't recoil from unpleasant feeling. You know, they're just passing feelings. And so you, can, you can relate to them in a more, you say, a, more, a wiser way, a more skillful way, recognizing that, you know, there is causal conditions, you know, I give the analogy of the of the uh, the butterfly complex, you know, like pleasant feelings, like butterflies. And some people, of course, they want to own the butterfly, but you know, when you try to grasp a butterfly, what happens? Squish. Huh? <laughs> you destroy the butterfly. The butterfly is only really. Uh, significant when it's allowed to fly, right? When you try and prevent it from flying, uh, it just becomes a little squish in your hand then. Uh, same with pleasant feeling. When you try and control it, it's not it not pleasant anymore. It becomes, you can, it's just like you crush it. It's not, not a light, uh, airy, flowing feeling anymore. It's really heavy. Uh, it becomes unpleasant. You try to, try to Hold on to it and preserve it, and and it just it, it kills it. Yeah. 
where the early agents talk about, you know, the, besides the five groups of grasping, they also talk about the, you can either talk about the positive ones, positive factors or the negative ones. You know, the hindrances or the factors of awakening. These are just, you know, they're just qualities or conditions that arise and pass away, conditions that arise and pass. And if you bring in a sense of self around them, then they get really, really sticky. The, the physical body, you know, the, in, the, in the tradition in India, was a, a look at the physicality in terms of the four elements, the four elemental qualities, earth, fire, water, air. It's not something very common in the West these days. But uh, maybe for, for many of us, we can maybe can look at it in terms of uh, this, this physicality is, is, is atoms and molecules or something. You know, if you study, if you know a bit about chemistry, you know, you know in, this, in this body there is, you know, there is, uh, there is H2O, uh, there is carbon, there is nitrogen, there is... So rather than look at the body as being some solid, permanent entity, you just see it as these changing elements, changing chemicals. When you, when you have, have something to eat, the chemical process happens in the body. Certain chemicals come in, they're converted, and certain chemicals go out. In Buddhist time, by having these four elements, earth, fire, water, air, I mean, it's, uh, you have to kind of study what they are, but uh, it's much easier to have just four elements rather than I don't know how many chemicals in the body, but... <laughs> But if you reflect upon the food, you're just eating, you know, you're just eating certain kind of molecules. You know, a bit of carbon, a bit of nitrogen, a bit of H2O or something or other. Yeah. Then you have a different relationship to it. And so it's just what happens to the body. You know, you've got different chemical formulas going on here, accumulating. There was one, uh, one Thai lady who came to, the, to live in the monastery in England, and uh, she knew about, she wasn't, uh, she, she learned this when she was at the monastery, I guess, because she wasn't born a Buddhist. She was born a Muslim. But she was very interested in Buddhist meditation. Yeah. So she came to the monastery, and she didn't know too much about the basic principles of Buddhism, but she knew about, one of them was about the four elements. And uh, she came to the monastery because, first of all, because she had cancer and was recovering. And then when she got, it, got cancer again, she came to the monastery to spend her last days there. And then when, one of the times that, uh, that when she was, as she was dying, she allowed people to come and sit with her. So when, when one time when I was there with a group of other monks and nuns and just sort of uh, keeping vigil with her, uh, she was very, very weak, um, breathing very, very faintly. And then during that time, the breathing stopped. And I just thought, oh, that's it. Yeah, she's passed away. Then she began to breathe again. Uh, then she looked up and she said, oh, yeah, sorry, not yet. <laughs> Even apologized. <laughs> You gotta come back tomorrow night. Maybe it'll be tomorrow night will be the, be the end. <laughs> but because she was a very good meditator, she was describing what happened. So she was saying, as she as she's lying there and the breath got fainter and fainter, she could feel the four elements: earth, fire, water, air, begin to break up, began to separate. Her body was separating into earth, fire, water, air, and they separated to a certain point. Then they stopped. Then came back together again. Then she she breathed in a fresh fresh breath of air, uh, and and life principle continued. Yeah. And I don't know. She didn't know much about Buddhist principles. I don't think, you know, she knew that much. 
but but it's said in the uh, in the scriptures it says that you know death is the breaking up of the elements she knew she knew this from experience she experienced it directly she didn't have to have to read about it beforehand she just knew that uh, that was the experience she had but it says that when the, when the body is getting weaker and weaker you know the, the sense of, of of solidity in the body begins to lessen and the four elements just break up and go back to their you know, everything is, is the four elements. So your, your body is earth, fire, water, air, just as this wall is and the floor is and the air and everything around us is just those elements. So it just goes back to it. Of course, it takes a while, you know, once the body has died, it takes a while for them to actually break down. But, you know, I guess a, a naturally decaying body would just turn into fertilizer again. Huh? You know, the, the earth goes to the earth, the water to the water, the air to the air, the, the, the heat, the fire, heat element cools down. And... So when you reflect upon these, these four elements, you know, I mean, you can see that sometimes. You now this body is just holding together. Uh, these four elements have come together and they're held there by a, a belief or a grasping of a sense of self. This is my body, my body. And then you get a sense maybe for just how you know, deeply ingrained. It's like an instinct to hold on to this body. Like an instinct, just like somebody who's lost in the ocean and hanging on to the life raft. And desperate. That's, that's how deeply ingrained this uh, belief in a permanent self is. That's why it's, you know, the... Buddha encourages us to reflect and contemplate uh, on this theme of no permanent self. It's not enough just to believe it and say, oh yes, the Buddha said it, so it must be right. But the uh, Buddha gave many contemplations. Another one was, uh, you know, besides the, the causally conditioned nature, it was how it was very, very similar to it, related to it, is how it was put together. This body is put together by various parts. Not just by causal processes, but it's, it's accumulation of different parts. And if, I think, uh, there was a, a book we had in the library at, in Chithurst, I think, and it was by some doctor. I, I can't remember, remember vaguely about it. And he said there's, there's only about six ways to die. You want to hear about six ways to die, actually. And it's like you're, you're, if, if oxygen stops to your brain, if your heart stops pumping, uh, your kidney, kidney begins to, doesn't function anymore. You know, basically, it's a, if any of the main organs cease to function, then that results in death. So, I mean, you got, you got, we have these various, you know, 32 parts traditionally. Of the body, you know. I mean, I guess if you're probably if your if your fingernails fall off, you're not going to die. But <laughs> you know, so, but if any of the, the, the six, or whatever it is, five or six primary primary organs cease to function, then death results. So we are just really composed of, you know, a heart and a liver and a, two kidneys and you know, a brain and is composed of these various parts. Now, if any of them break down, that's it. It's no more considered to be body. And this was uh, uh, kind of very vividly illustrated by one of the bhikkhunis. I think her name was Bhikkhuni Vajira. And apparently she was sitting in the forest meditating and then Mara came to her and said something about, you know, why do you why do you cling to this life? You know why do you cling to this to this being? And then she answered him, saying, "What do you speak of being, like human being? You know this 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 organism is only composed of various elements, various parts, just like you know just like just like the the chariot is composed of various parts." And there's a wheel, and there's a, 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 a an axle, and then there's a, a a stalk to pull it, and then there's a, a box to sit in, and 
you know, when those parts come together, you know, they're, they're constructed. When they come together, you call it a chariot. Just the same as the body. When the body comes together, you know, these, these various organs come together and mature, you call it a body. But, but you look at it carefully, where is the body? It's just parts. Yeah. And any of them can break down. Yeah, if the wheel falls off the chariot, it's no longer a chariot anymore, is it? Yeah, if, if your heart stops beating, is it a body anymore? <laughs> Looks like it from the outside, but it's not a living body anymore. So when we look at it in those, those terms, we, we see that, oh, it's just, you know, anything can go wrong here. You know, you can get, you can get a certain disease, you can get a certain, you know, a certain ailment. And if maybe it affects your, your, one of your main organs, and that's it. But this, this life is just held together by these various things functioning. You know. When you think of it that way, you think it's quite miraculous that this body can survive. There's so many things can go wrong with it. It's not like, you know, I, I, this, this, this body is, is like this, it's perfect already, you know, and if it breaks down, it's, it's unfortunate. No, I mean, the body is, is, is made up of all these different parts, uh, just like a computer or, or, or a car maybe or something. One piece breaks down and the, the car is finished or the computer is finished. So our so-called, you know, uh, our self is really, you know, when you look at it, it's very, very fragile. And we, we, we tend to, you know, believe it's got more and more power or potency than it really has. But you investigate it, you begin to slowly see it. There's no permanent self. It's just held together by these various elements, by these various forces, causality, various parts. And then you step away from it. And you let go of that belief that this, this permanent self exists. Where is it actually? You begin to see through it, see through this illusion. Uh, so the ignorance began to begin to, can begin to fade away, begin to just, just dissipate like, like the fog in the morning. But it requires, you know, it requires a certain amount of, of continuity and effort because that underground belief in the permanent self is right there, snap back again. Memory comes up and immediately you're, you're lost in your story, you know, my story, just myself again, going here, going there. Got to stop and reflect, oh, just a memory. Just like it'll, you know, going through your, your catalog of photographs, that's all. And there was, you know, there was a, a body and a mind there at that time, and it recorded that, and where is it today? It's gone. A new body-mind process has carried on. And of course, there is the, you know, the, uh, uh, depends upon the, the, the depth of one's investigation. Yeah, the Buddha is encouraging us to to contemplate these, these teachings, you know, continuously. I mean, sometimes we get distracted by various things, but, you know, if we at least know what the, the teachings are, we can apply them, even in our life situation, ordinary life situation. You know, when there is, you know, suffering arises, you know, rather than be confused by it and suffer by it, and just recognize, oh, right, there it is one of the ultimate realities of life. Suffering, unsatisfactoriness. My great teacher. And you can't continue on this path, even though you may, you may like it, but it's going to cause you suffering in the long term. Yeah. And these things which I hold on to as being, you know, being my possessions and things, yeah, they're, they're impermanent. Yeah. Especially when it comes down to body and mind. Constantly changing, constantly changing. There's another man who came to stay in the monastery in, in England. And uh, when, we, when he was getting near the end of his life, at that time there was, I think, the, the abbot at the time, he was quite keen on uh, 
being you know allowing people to come there and uh, using you know, so people could use the the meditation on death and dying as a as, as a contemplation. It's usually it's so covered up in the West these days. You know, and the, and the monasteries are usually you know full of young tough people. <laughs> People who are people who are not very you know not very strong. Of course, you know, old people. It's trying hard to live in a monastery. It's too austere. So, but this man was a, he was sort of like an intellectual Buddhist. I would say, he read a lot of books about Buddhism, and he, he was, thought he was very well well informed and could quote the scriptures. Yeah. But in his process of of dying, you know, one of the one of the well, one, not one of the first, but one of the things to go was his knowledge. All the information, all the things he learned began to fade away. Got more and more confused and he, he couldn't recall the scriptures anymore and his brain was, was slowing down. Yeah. Getting more and more cloudy and less energy, less, less energy physically and less energy mentally too. And he got really frightened. All my knowledge of Buddhism is, is, is fading away, it's going away. Yeah. Fortunately, there were people there, you know, monks there. It's, you know, things are impermanent, right? Oh, yeah. I remember that now. It's written on page so-and-so of the scriptures, yes. <laughs> but he, he knew the information, but he hadn't been practicing it. You know, all that information, all that knowledge you have. I mean, uh, you know, I had, uh, I had <laughs> experience already, you know, all the Things I learned in school, I can't remember hardly anything now. <laughs> so, I know not to rely upon things you've learned, not to, re not to rely upon book reading. To be a helpful guide to give you the right reflections, but you don't hang on to it. Try and put it into practice, use it as like a sign, a signpost and a, and a way to go. That's where you should be, should be directed, direct your attention to that to impermanence, not how much knowledge you can hang on to, but to contemplate it as impermanent uh, knowledge, physical strength. That's why, that's why it's important to be able to put it into practice. I mean, you notice these moments when you, you know, when you feel a bit confused or a bit, uh, you know, you, you forget something, aha, there's a lesson in impermanence. Rather than kick yourself and say, I should remember that. My, my brain's not so good anymore. I should, you know, take some more, uh, whatever it is, ginkgo biloba or something. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Recognize, oh, there's a sign of impermanence. It's a, it's, a, it's a lesson in, in anatta, no permanent self. And then you're, you're, you're now in tune with the way things really are. Rather than trying to, you know, trying to change it, trying to fight against it. You know, I should remember, I should know. That, that's impermanence, lesson in permanence. And when we can open to those lessons, then we're much more in harmony with the Dhamma, the way it is. Yeah, all of our life is teaching us these things. Some of the lessons are a bit humiliating, a bit humbling, you know. And when your body is breaking down, it's very, very humbling to accept that this is not your body, you can't control it anymore. And your mind is getting more confused or you have doubts about things and yep, that's the way it is. It's a lesson in impermanence and no permanent self. So when we begin, we can reflect in those ways, then we have less suffering. We're more in tune with how things really are, the way things really are. Rather than try to resist them and fight them. And when we're, when we're resisting it, you know, there is a sign, a symbol then, that uh, it's a sign that we're still holding on to some fixed view. Yeah. A fixed view is a sign of holding on to a self. I'm defending myself, I'm defending my view about myself. And, but being able to flow with the changes, uh, 
recognize that uh, you can let go now, learn to let go the views, the, 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 the stubbornness. Then you begin to flow with things. Less obstacles, less, less stress, less suffering. You begin to recognize, oh, that is in harmony with the Dhamma then. Now, like I say, we, you know, we, we learn these lessons of no permanent self. It, sometimes it is, you know, not that can, for some people can sound like a really obscure and profound teaching. You know, if I only had insight into anatta, like the Buddha, I could be enlightened. We're getting these lessons all the time. This, the lessons in no permanent self are happening all the time. This body is constantly changing and you, know, you want it to be warm and it's cold and you want it to be cold and it's warm and can't control it. There's no permanent self there to control. So when we understand these principles, we can apply them in our life situation and gradually become sort of integrated into our way of living then. Not just a, a thought we, we've heard somewhere or we read about in the book. That's our way of relating to life then. And that's what the Buddhist teaching is designed to do. To do. You live in harmony with the Dhamma, then there's no, no more suffering, beyond suffering, the path beyond suffering. So that's to be realized each person for themselves. So we all, each one of us know how much we suffer. You also know how much you don't need to suffer. So it's up to you to find out the way to beyond suffering then. So I leave that for your reflection this evening.